Hi, Dr. Chu. Hi, Whitney. How, how are you? Thank you for being with us today. I'm good. Thank you so much for having me on. You know, I, I'm sure that you're working uh, around the clock these days, so it really it means a lot that you took some time um, to, to be with us. And, um, you know, I think uh, I, I asked how you are, but I uh, would love to hear, you know, truly, like, how are, how are things going? Um, how are you uh, making out uh, in, in these times? Yeah, I mean, I personally can't complain. You know, Oregon is not New York right now. We've actually taken a lot of early public health measures and uh, are being pretty successful at flattening the curve. So certainly, um, I mean, we're seeing cases. It is a time like no other in healthcare. I mean, really experienced nothing like this. Um, it is, uh, you know, I'm part of this kind of big community of frontline healthcare workers and, and talking to my friends around the country and around the world, really who are in the emergency room or, or are uh, working in the intensive care units. And it, um, it is uh, an incredibly stressful time uh, as a whole. Um, but, uh, but here in Oregon, we're, we're lucky to still be waiting for the wave to hit us. And, and you, you know, mentioned this, that Oregon is not, has not been hit as hard as some other states. Um, but I guess, could you talk a little bit more about what you were saying there with Oregon flattening the curve and tell us a little bit more about what the situation looks like there and then also in your hospital specifically. Yeah, I mean, um, the uh, the first case in the United States, of course, came to Seattle, which is just three and a half hours uh, up the road. Um, as it happened, it came. The first case that was detected was someone who works at uh, the school where my, my that my kids attend, which is one block from my house. Um, so when it came to Oregon, it started feeling real very quickly. Um, and then early on, we saw the pattern that we were seeing across the United States. Um, I mean, the doubling times here were every two and a half to three days. Um, and I think between watching what was happening in Seattle, where uh, the cases really exploded, um, we uh, we took our stay at home order very seriously, you know, so um, schools were shut down pretty early on. Um, people have really been trying to abide by stay at home uh, recommendations. And um, and we we watched that doubling time start to stretch out and the progress, the uh, projections for what our hospitals would see for our needs for bed space for intensive care unit space and for ventilators um, started going down until um, until you could see that probably we will be within the resources that we have in our state, which is wonderful. And earlier this week, you know, Oregon was able to um, to pledge to send 140 ventilators to New York City to, to try to help them meet the need in, in this time of crisis. Um, so it's, you know, we're still at the stage where it's very, very different from state to state. I mean, um, the cat is kind of out of the bag in, in certain states, in Washington and in New York. Um, but many other states still have the opportunity to change their fate. Um, so it's really a day-to-day -day battle to make sure that we stay in the game and that we uh, we continue to be really vigilant with all of our public health measures or even escalate efforts so that we can get over that hump um, and get to the other side of this thing. I mean, and that's it's amazing to hear um, that things seem to be going really well or going uh, more, are doing much better in Oregon. Um, and you know, I'm I'm curious uh, talking about those other states that you mentioned that maybe aren't faring as well. I know you're in touch with a lot of colleagues in other parts of the country. Um, you know, what are you hearing uh, from folks who are maybe in some of those harder hit areas? Yeah, it's really unlike anything you've seen. I mean, uh, the thing to understand about uh, emergency care and disaster response systems is this is what we do. You know, it's not like we run on the assumption of of normality. You know, we we are always planning for the worst case scenario, and so we're we're prepared for disasters. But but normal uh, quote unquote normal disasters are are so much more contained than this. So you know, we're ready for earthquakes, hurricanes, other national uh, natural disasters, or um, maybe a single mass casualty, all these things that have so much more, um, so many more uh, sort of borders to them, you know, these discrete events. Maybe they affect a single city or a region um, or, um, you know, uh, you're in a position where other states or regions can can chip in. I mean, you've seen after some of our, our largest um, disasters, things like 9-11, other countries were so willing to 
sort of lend a hand in terms of our um, our of, of addressing our aftermath and um, and this is one of those things where um, where should the help be coming because we're all dealing with this at the same time and so everybody is either in uh, full in it you know like they are in New York City either they are they are in there um, just trying to deal with a huge caseload of patients and the very sick patients and just scrambling to be really creative around these um, these limited resources that we have, everything from personal protective equipment to the medications and space and ventilators and healthcare workers, um, to just being in full on preparation mode. Um, and that's kind of where we are right now in Oregon because our, um, our peak is expected to hit at the end of April or early May. And so we're using that precious time to try to figure out um, in every eventuality, how are we going to, to handle this surge? Um, so no matter what, whether the wave has hit or whether it's about to hit, everyone is really working 24-7 around this pandemic. And, you know, when I think about emergency workers, even before this time, um, you know, I always think about room in general, just like a, you know, a sort of chaotic, frantic space. And, you know, I imagine that that may change, have changed a little bit in the, the recent weeks. And so could you talk a little bit about what your day-to-day -day, uh, experiences are like now as compared to what they would have been like, what they were like uh, pre-pandemic? Yeah, totally. And again, I'll speak to um, the experiences of healthcare workers that I'm hearing from everywhere, um, so, uh, yeah. you know, rather than just my individual ER. But um, there, there's kind of two parts to this. One is in normal times, we run hospitals pretty lean, you know, so we don't we don't run it so that uh, you walk into a shift and you're relaxing for half of it, you know, <laughs> or um, yeah. or so that we have a bunch of empty beds just in case. I mean, you run it to be pretty close to maxed out all the time um, because we really run it for financial efficiency. You know, so hospitals more and more are very full. Um, we're not expanding hospital wards. We're, we're really running them as, as um, uh, pretty close to peak. And in the emergency department, I'm on a regular day, let's say a weekend evening shift, uh, when, a, when an ER doctor walks in or an ER nurse walks in, you kind of stop and take this deep breath because you know you're going to be running nonstop, um, basically all out for your entire shift, eight to 12 hours or whatever it is. And so in normal circumstances, we are, I mean, you feel pretty close to max capacity. Um, and then add on to that a pandemic. Um, and you kind of think of your worst regular day. And, um, and in places where they've already hit surge, it's twice regular or three times or five times or 10 times that. And so you, you went from, uh, it never was a relaxing job. I mean, it was always a stressful job where there's only so much one person can do, and yet you're doing more than that all the time and just trying to keep people safe um, to really, to really, you know, some order of magnitude higher than that. So places that are hit hard, really impossibly busy. Um, and then, um, and then on the flip side, uh, we are, we have really done a, a lot of work in terms of public messaging and messaging through our health system that if you are not very sick, you should stay away. Uh, because first of all, we need to care for these COVID-19 patients. And also, you don't want to get sick by coming here because this is where the COVID-19 patients are coming. So for your own safety and your family's safety, please stay away. And so people, even people with um, very serious health conditions are are staying away. Um, and our, our uh, caseload in the emergency room is actually very different. Um, and so we're disproportionately seeing patients who have fever, you know, respiratory illnesses, um, symptoms that uh, are likely COVID-19, but almost everything else has gone away or gone down. Um, I think what else has contributed to that is that with all of the social distancing, so people are staying at home, they're not going to parties or bars or restaurants or places where you might drink a lot and get into trouble afterwards. So a lot of that Friday night, Saturday night trauma that we would normally normally see, car accidents from drunk driving um, or just from high traffic conditions. I mean, all the things that happen when you throw a whole bunch of humans together in close quarters, um, though, that, that is kind of our bread and butter um, in the emergency room. And, and we're not seeing that whole chunk as much. Um, the puzzling mm -hmm. thing is actually why we're not seeing things that have no relationship to COVID-19. I mean, heart attacks, strokes, 
those diseases have not gotten any notice that they should wait until COVID is over, you know? And so where are those diseases? I mean, there was an op-ed in the New York Times the other day wondering if people who have very legitimate reasons to come into the hospitals are also avoiding, uh, avoiding the hospital. Not that uh, other things aren't legitimate, but, you know, things that, that are true emergencies that should be, should be seen immediately um, otherwise can lead to very poor outcomes or, or even death um, in a short period of time. Uh, what, you know, what kind of collateral damage are we seeing because people are afraid to come in? So, um, but all of that adds up to a very strange environment in the hospital right now. Yeah, I mean, and that's, and that's so interesting to hear. It sounds like in some ways people are being really more thoughtful about how, when they actually do need to seek out care and when they can handle something themselves. And I, and I imagine it probably remains to be seen whether that's better that people are dealing with some things on their own at home or or whether that's worse. Um, what is your take on that? Probably a mix of both. I mean, I think the truth is right in the middle. Uh, I think when we go back to normal, um, it's hard to imagine a time that we'll go back to normal, but um, probably when we go back to normal, we'll see um, some things we've learned um, can stay out of the emergency room or, uh, you know, I think we're being very creative about telehealth right now and um, getting people to to get health care through their computers or their phones. Um, and I think we'll probably find that that um, that we continue to have expanded use of telemedicine after this because it worked so well. Um, I bet people will actually be very happy and surprised by the number of things that you can do at home for some common health conditions. Um, but I also think that when the surge is over for every state, we will get an influx of those delayed care cases that will kind of be the second surge uh, of stress on the healthcare system, um, not directly rated, related to COVID-19, but um, what we're kind of calling the collateral damage, um, deferred health problems that really could have benefited from an earlier visit to the hospital emergency room or an in-person visit to your, doc to your doctor or uh, nurse practitioner or whoever. And, you know, as the months have gone on um, and, you know, we've been dealing with this as a country, as a world, uh, you know, for these past few months in, in, in emergency rooms, in your emergency room, how have you seen the situation change or, or worsen? Um, you know, how are things different now than they were, say, back in early February? I mean, now we are in it. I mean, all of us to some extent. Um, I mean, it's hit all 50 states. And so uh, it went from this anticipation to really needing to make those hard decisions. And uh, I mean, this is so challenging always, but in this disease, we're not familiar with it. And so we are learning on the fly. So we're learning from China, from Italy, from South Korea, and then from our own early states. But um, that decision making changes so fast that um, that really there are some days where I feel like the, the hospital I walk out of at the end of my shift is different than the hospital I walk into at the beginning of my shift. And I'm hearing this from colleagues all over the place. It's not just at my institution where um, people are sitting, um, you know, we've created these these COVID emergency um, task force or committees that make decisions for for every health system. And people are, are sitting and receiving data as it rolls in and then using that data to enrich the response in their own institution. So um, whether it's, um, I'm trying to think of a, a good example, like even just what we decide to do around, around face masks or around um, how we manage certain types of patients, what medications um, we're looking at uh, as potential therapies. I mean, this is how wild and, and quick it is. Um, a few weeks ago, earlier in this pandemic, um, we were concerned about a certain class of blood pressure medication called ARBs, uh, angiotensin receptor block blockers. And um, the rumor was that these were harmful, that these would actually lead to more severe disease. And there was a question about whether we should be taking patients off of those medications um, uh, who were using them for blood pressure control. Mm -hmm. Three weeks later, that medication is being used in the hospital as a potential therapy. I mean, that is how fast the science is changing. It was, it was bad. Now it's potentially really good. I mean, I, it, it's a constant process of keeping up with what the best evidence is telling us um, is right to do. And I mean, I'll just tell you, um, you're always wondering, am I getting it wrong right now? Because I feel like it's going to be different in about uh, 24 hours and you just do the best that you can with, uh, with current information. Well, I mean, so you've been documenting your experiences and uh, sort of talking about what, how you've been um, going through this pandemic in your new podcast, uh, Doctor's Log. 
And um, you know, you've talked about some of the unique challenges that uh, health workers are facing. Um, one of those being uh, heightened exposure to the virus. And so I'd love to talk about that a little bit. Just you know, what are some of the physical ways? What is the physical toll um, that this pandemic is having on health workers? Yeah, this is um, uh, this is so stressful. I mean, we are used to working under conditions where your risk is some non-zero number above that of the general population. You know. Um, we see dangerous infections all the time. Um, there is uh, violence in the health care work, workplace um, uh, because of the volatility of what we see all the time. And so there's a little bit of, you know, adrenaline there that's that's always present and that we, we're used to. Over time, you actually become completely inured to some of these things that aren't a part of other people's day-to-day -day existence. Um, but with this, we have, a, 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 you know, a disease that's highly transmissible and also um, is, is, um, leads to very severe disease. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, and then you throw in there the shortage of this one simple resource, which is this personal protective equipment. Um, and, and when you put those three things together, um, and we're seeing a high volume of patients, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it really becomes stressful uh, on a different level because it's rare that we see something in the hospital where we have to worry, um, what am I bringing home to my family member because I wasn't perfectly protected against this very dangerous disease? And I think when you add on that layer of personal stress all the time, am I, uh, by, by doing this thing that I love to do, care for patients, um, am I putting my family at risk? Am I putting other patients at risk, my colleagues at risk? I, I think that has been one of the most, um, emotionally draining things of this uh, of this whole pandemic is just uh, not just be, be not being free to come kind of go in and just uh, do your clinical duty to the top of your potential but having this added layer of uh, of constant stress about how much um, you're able to do it safely yeah I mean it's uh, seeing these headlines really across the world about the number of health workers who um, contract the virus and um, you know, that sort of thing is, uh, is, is really upsetting. And, um, you know, thank you, uh, Dr. Chu, uh, for all you do. Um, and I think uh, another thing that you talk about, you know, and also thinking about, you, you mentioned not having uh, PPE, but also other equipment that we've seen a lot in the headlines that are, uh, we're lacking in our hospitals or a shortage of our ventilators. Um, and you've talked about this and how it's not just enough to think about the ventilators themselves, um, but you know, what are some other factors that we need to consider when we're thinking about uh, the need for ventilators in, in medical centers and, and hospitals? Yeah, the, the needs are, are so great. And it's really everything that, um, you know, it's everything that surrounds the ventilator. Um, it, you know, it's it, none of these things live in isolation, you know. Um, and so when I think of just the issue of the ventilator um, that we're running out of, it, it's like, well, you, you actually need highly trained staff to use a ventilator. It's not like you can just take anybody um, and just put them next to a ventilator and they can start programming it um, in this uh, super fancy, you know, <laughs> with with, yeah. with all skill and confidence. You know, we we rely on the fact that there's a, a highly trained workforce, including respiratory therapist, intensive care unit trained, specifically trained physicians, um, nurses who are really experienced in in ICU care. Um, even to put somebody on a ventilator, you need a number of common medications. Um, to sedate and paralyze them so that they can tolerate the insertion of a, a pretty rigid plastic tube down their throat, um, and then to keep them in a, a state that's comfortable so that they can stay on that tube for many, many days, um, which is a, a very uncomfortable thing, potentially. And so, um, you know, and so we need all of those medications and we need them in pretty large quantities. Um, and then, of course, you know, ventilators need to go into intensive care units. Um, those intensive care units uh, require a lot of maintenance. I mean, the cleaning staff to uh, to clean an uh, uh, intensive care unit where there's been a COVID positive patient um, in, uh, th these are larger rooms, they have a lot of equipment in it. Often the, the cleaning after a COVID-19 patient to do it right and disinfect that space so it's safe for the next patient, that's an hour and 20 to 30 minute process or more, depending on the facility. Um, so, or that, that room is just out of use. And so, I mean, there really is a complex team that it takes in order to maintain um, an intensive care unit around a single machine 
it's really hard to um, to convey that all the time. You know, it's a lot easier to say we need this single resource. Um, let's manufacture it and get it out there. Um, and I will say too, just um, this this whole thing is really such an education on public health messaging and how we get. Um, ordinary people and policymakers to kind of get galvanized around some of these issues that are buried deep within a hospital. It's like the deeper you get into a hospital and the further you get from outside of it, the harder it is to communicate these needs. And so, you know, testing was something that was very relatable to people and that we were really able to raise public outrage about because everybody suddenly wanted to get tested, right? I mean, you had a virus, the the the, the um, COVID-19 disease was in the country, you wanted to know whether you had it. And so um, if you didn't, then somebody you knew really wanted that test. Um, PPE, the personal protective equipment, that was a little harder. Um, that's the first step into the hospital. What do you need? If you're working on COVID-19, you need some PPE. And so, and there was something so visual about it, right? Um, we saw pictures of healthcare workers with their masks and their goggles and their gowns. And, um, and we saw those images um, from other countries where they were wearing them or not wearing them. You see the pictures, um, one of the most vivid pictures, I think, that will remain in people's memories after this is the pictures of the healthcare workers with the bruises around their faces for wearing these masks nonstop. Um, it, because normally we don't always wear personal protective equipment for every single patient, but having to wear it for patient after patient, for hundreds of patients over a shift, um, people started to get bruising on their faces. And there was something so visual and um, visceral and relatable about that. And so we got people really excited about PPE, and I'm so glad um, because I think we will get relief in those um, in that resource soon. Um, after that, um, our ability to kind of communicate our needs are as critical as they are. They may be as critical as PPE and, and as testing once you get downstream to a stage of disease where you need to be treated in the hospital. Um, it's very hard to communicate how badly we need these things um, and get the kind of, uh, you know, the public interest uh, and, and outrage and energy around it. Uh, but really every single thing that we need um, uh, in the hospital is uh, is um, we're starting to strain the supply. Hmm. I'd love to jump uh, in. Have Helen here. Yeah, yeah, please, Helen. So many questions pouring into Facebook, so I'll just share a couple and then I'll jump back off. But I think uh, overwhelmingly the number one question that people have is, how can they help? All right, um, I'm sorry, that question just kind of kills me. <laughs> Um, it kills me every time. And you'd think I'd be ready for it because so many people are asking me. Um, so, ooh, give me a second. Take your Take all the seconds to me. <laughs> so first of all, everyone who asked that question, thank you. I mean, we feel, feel the outpouring of goodwill and um, and I mean, that is honestly what keeps us going to work every single day and gives us energy to do this. And it actually it makes me feel like, um, how can I do more? Um, so thank you. And I will say there there are uh, a million ways to help. Um, I'll, I'll throw out a couple of simple things. So first of all, whatever you do to help your own community helps us. So um, even if you're not out there, I mean, a lot of people are sewing face masks and things are contributing to, um, you know, to the to increasing the supply of PPE. And that's wonderful. But uh, but it doesn't have to be that literal. So when you contribute to your local food bank, your local homeless or domestic violence um, shelter, your local diaper bank um, in any way, um, contributing to the needs of the community around here, you are helping us. And I will tell you, even in times of pandemic, we are seeing people come to the hospital because they are lacking food and they are lacking shelter because those needs are still paramount for people. And so when you help in those ways, that is health care that you are giving directly um, and you are helping us every single day keep people healthy. So those things are so valuable. Um, I think the second thing is to come into the healthcare mentality which is that um, this is not going to be short. It is going to be prolonged. And there is no single campaign that will win this thing. There are going to be many campaigns after campaigns. And I always feel like I'm giving bad news, um, but I want people to kind of spread the word that this needs to be a really sustained effort. We don't have an end date. Um, we may even have a second surge of disease, um, particularly if we don't get this right. We don't have a timing for things like vaccines um, and effective treatments. Those things simply take time. So I would say um, take the little breaks that you need to from your helping role. Um, help when you have the energy um, 
and uh, you know, and the resources to do so, but also take time for yourself. Um, but understand that this is not going to be short. Um, and then the last thing I would say is remember that sometimes what we don't do is as important as what we do do. And so people are always worried that they haven't done enough, but remember that restraint is so important here. And one example I'll give is every time there's a whiff of promise around a medication, people are going out and they are, they are, um, trying to get people to prescribe it to them. They're, um, they're filling these prescriptions in, um, in quantities that are much higher than than anybody needs, um, and really there's some medication hoarding that's going on. So I would ask people, um, you know, wait for the evidence and the recommendations. Please let health professionals guide how we use these resources, and um, and please don't do the toilet paper thing for any resource in healthcare. Um, uh, we need to we need to have enough restraint that the limited resources we have get to those who really need them. Um, that goes for a number of things. Also, those you know high filtration face masks. And people in the public do not need to be wearing those, and those should go directly to healthcare workers. One other question, and then I'll jump back into the comments, but <clears throat> there's a question around the risk of using a drug for something it wasn't intended, and I guess this is a reference to chloroquine, which has become a kind of a word that non-medical professionals are now using liberally, but um, what do you make of the kind of the sudden resurgence of people's awareness and knowledge of chloroquine, and what should we actually think about it? Yeah, there, um, you know, every time there is a pandemic, there are a number of medications that have theoretical benefit um, because they have um, in vitro action against, um, against the virus. And there have been many disappointments. <laughs> I mean, all, all of these medications that we're talking about, hydrochloroquine and azithromycin and um, antivirals that are effective against different viruses, we wonder, can it work against this virus? Maybe. Um, the excitement about these medications, hy um, hydroxychloroquine, I think, is the one that's been mentioned the most. I mean, really through the roof. I'm excited, too. Uh, it would be nice to know if it works. We have very little data on these. Um, we have not been able to do these randomized controlled trials that will allow us to know um, not only are they effective, but is the is the good that they're doing, um, uh, does it exceed the harms? Um, because all these medications have potential toxicity on, um, you know, um, they have psychiatric side effects, they have cardiotoxicity, particularly in combination with other medications that affect your heart, they can cause um, very serious illness, seizures, um, and even death. And we've seen um, we've seen an early death um, from uh, from the use of chloroquine. So um, so a lot of caution here in every sense. Um, there is no indication for people to go out um, and start using these medications as either prophylaxis or treatment. Um, really worried about how people can hurt themselves inadvertently, um, particularly if they're taking these outside the recommendation of a health professional. I mean, that's just a nightmare waiting to happen. And I'll also say, I mean, this sort of goes in line with um, with the issue of medication shortages, but I mean, the, the treatment for um, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine overdoses um, is, is generally uh, benzodiazepines, which is another medication that we're in very short supply of we need critically for intensive care unit patients. And so, um, you know, everything has consequences um, that we will then have to grapple with. So uh, uh, not, uh, you know, unsupported use of these medications is really uh, has the potential to be another disaster buried within this disaster. We do not want that. OK, I'm jumping off. Thank you so much. Back to you, Whitney. The vaccine, Helen. You know, it's so you, you talked about. Um, sort of how you've been advocating for PPE and our, and our need for that. And um, you advocate for a lot of things that in, the, in this public health space that I think um, are, are just really critically important at this time. And one of those things is uh, the work that you're doing with um, Jupe Health. And I'd love to talk a little bit about that um, as far as looking at building emergency health centers and creating these spaces uh, at this time. And uh, as we're seeing that hospitals are overcrowded um, throughout the country, the world, um, you know, I guess how how long before we get to a point where where we, we really are beyond capacity um, and and need to, to seek out alternative uh, measures? Yeah, we're, we're already seeing it in New York, and I think we will actually see this space shortage in every major city, and then a different kind of space shortage actually in rural and critical access areas. 
Um, so, you know, in large cities, we're running out of space in every single, you know, of every single kind. So, yes, it is the intensive care units and it's the hospital wards and it's the space in the emergency department. And you've seen these, uh, I think you've seen these pictures in, um, in emergency medicine triage where people are packed in there like sardines, um, no doubt transmitting disease while they're waiting, you know, and so some hospitals are bumping out to large tents places where they can enforce, try to enforce social distancing while people are waiting to be seen, some of them very sick. Um, but there's also housing needs around healthcare. So increasingly, as we're seeing uh, many, many very sick COVID patients, and particularly when you add in that layer of inadequate PPE, our personal pr uh, protective equipment, um, healthcare workers are not wanting to go home. And that's a very reasonable thing to want because um, we we want to um, we want to shield our families as we do this. I mean, the number of uh, many many healthcare workers I know are, are sick and have to go into quarantine away from their families. Um, and so, where do we do that? I mean, hospitals are only equipped to handle a very small handful of healthcare workers spending the night. You know, so um, you go into any hospital in a regular time, and the wards are empty at night, and you just have a tiny handful of physicians who are required to stay. Um, in-house overnight um, to, to sleep there, you know, um, between uh, between daytime hours. And so you'll have a, a couple of call rooms. And now we have this um, this situation where a, a large portion of our healthcare staff does not want to go home in between. And so we're getting really generous offers. I mean, in the uh, in New York City, for example, the Four Seasons offered its hotel rooms up to um, up to healthcare workers who wanted to stay there to, to keep their families safe um, or to avoid the commute between shifts. Um, and that's great, but you know, most hospitals aren't lucky enough to be next door to um, a luxury hotel where they can spend a month. Um, and so how are we bumping out housing in addition to all the, the healthcare space we need? And um, and so that's why I started working with um, this amazing team. Um, it's a, a project called Jupe Health. And we're building three kinds of units um, as fast as we can. So um, this uh, this expanded housing for healthcare workers and actually for other people who have COVID-19 or likely have COVID-19 and cannot go back to their their living situation for whatever reason. So you think of people living in homeless shelters, domestic violence shelters, group homes, nursing homes, um, uh, 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 correctional facilities, um, uh, psychiatric units, basically. Um, all these places that we're calling coronavirus traps because people are held in there. There is no option for social distancing and uh, the infection is spreading like wildfire fire unless we take known cases um, and actually pull them out. Um, so expanded housing can be used for any of those populations um, and then basic hospital beds and then um, and then actually these um, these mobile intensive care units that are being designed with um, architecture, design teams, engineering teams, and a, a whole bunch of health professionals and also patients and patient advocates. Um, and we're trying to make a very functional space um, that can be shipped anywhere in the United States very quickly. Um, there are hospitals in remote areas that don't have hundreds of ICU beds that they can mobilize. They might have two ICU beds, um, but all of a sudden they're not able to transfer all the COVID patients that they need to take care of. And so we want to see to their needs as well as we see that the needs of people in very densely populated areas that simply don't have room. I mean, I think the reality is we, we can't, you know, we can't run hospitals that have, um, have endless capacity for surge. I mean, that's just not something that you can build and maintain. So what are creative ways we can, we can do this? We can, create um, very deployable extra space, uh, not just for this crisis, but, but for every single other one that we face moving forward. And you know, when you think about these needs uh, for health workers and, and just for the, the broader community, um, you know, how much of this is uh, on the government? And I, you know, and I, I'm curious to hear, I guess what you feel like uh, in thinking about uh, this crisis, what the government has, getting right both on the federal state level? Um, and then what are some of the areas that uh, really uh, still need more attention? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's pretty fair to say that the, the government response as a whole has been disappointing. Um, the biggest tragedy is that when that those first cases came in the United States that we didn't get on top of the testing that day. Um, not even that day, the month before, when we knew that this was starting to spread and it was clear this was going to be a global pandemic, um, it, 
it really, um, I, I find it hard to even think about because I, it's so upsetting um, that we didn't just roll out testing um, and case and contact identification very assertively from the beginning. Um, I mean, that was the difference between what will ultimately be hundreds of thousands of lives um, lost and, um, and, and having saved all those lives um, will be that early thing. And, you know, you're psychologically, it's so bad to dwell. <laughs> I'm trying not to dwell on that first mistake, but, um, and really just kind of move forward and say, okay, how do we avoid that, um, that, uh, that, fail. Um, and, and that's kind of been where I'm trying to push the conversation. Like, okay, what's the next thing? <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, we're kind of got behind testing. We still aren't where we need to be with testing, but then, then what, um, you know, what are the other containment measures? And then when we get to the, you know, downstream to the treatment, everything's really about containment and then treatment capacity. Um, and I, I think containment is where I really wanted to focus. And then it was like, okay, well, we, because we failed in containment, we better shift quickly and think about care um, escalation. So um, how do we expand our care capacity? And it's sad to me that's that's where I need to be. But since we're going to be doing large scale care, um, what are all the little gaps that we need um, to fill? So and I think the really hard thing, uh, I mean, I've been involved in in these um, organizations to try to improve our PPE supply. Um, the And I can, you know, we're all so many hundreds of thousands of people are involved in this, and and I think we're able to boost supply here and there, um, and and have um, have some successes. But uh, what we can't do, what is very hard to do on the grassroots level, is to um, centralize our understanding of the problem. I mean, there should be in an ideal world a, a national command center that has its fingers on the pulse across all 50 states. Um, that knows uh, where are all of our hospitals and, and health systems and clinics, um, what are their patient um, caseloads like, and uh, what do they need of every single resource, um, whether it's human resources or or these concrete, these um, these res these uh, supply resources, and then understands um, the national supply and can divert resources exactly where they need to go at the exact right time, including identifying places that are getting over the, you know, the surge and are able to reallocate to other places where they're just entering their surge. So that kind of centralized national coordinating role is something that we're really missing here. Um, and I think um, not only does it make it hard for all of us to get the resources we need, but um, there's real equity issues here. Um, I worry all the time about who is getting the limited resources. Um, it's probably the really enriched health systems that have a lot of political power in their communities and, uh, you know, have already were kind of well resourced going in. They're likely to get more um, and smaller and less resourced places are simply not going to get the attention, um, the political will, the the voice to to get what they need. Um, and that affects their um their communities, and so there's there's huge inequities that are going to be doubled down because we don't have a, a coordinated system that um, that has some you know some structure in place to make sure these decisions and resources are equitably um, made. Helen has some some more questions from online. I do. I have overweening love for you and gratitude <laughs> for everything that you're doing, you're um, and I have some questions too. Um, so one is uh, someone has five N95 masks. They want to donate them, but they're not quite sure how to do that. How how can how can they help? How can they get those masks to you or to your colleagues? Oh, thank you. Um, so most hospitals have listed drop-off locations for N95s um, and hours, and actually have built methods for people to be able to drive by, not get out of your car and risk yourself by coming into a healthcare center, but to be able to do it on the outside with minimal contact. Um, and so I would encourage you to um, to either call your local hospital or health system. Almost everybody has a COVID hotline set up or the, the hospital operator can divert you to it. Um, also, if you go on some of these coordinating websites, the one I'm involved with is called getusppe.org. Um, we have um, by state a sorted list of hospitals uh, that are accepting PPE donations, including the address and hours of drop-off. So you can go right there and hopefully find one that's close to you. 
And then this is uh, arguably a more personal question, so apologies in advance, but we've seen a really shocking rise in anti-Asian discrimination through this. Um, and I just wonder what message you have for people who are turning inwards or who are allowing their fear and anger to turn outwards to another, um, to, uh, to another group, if you have any words of wisdom on that. Yeah, this is, um, this is another one of those collateral damage pieces that is so disturbing with this virus. I mean, the virus from the minute um, we were aware of it came along with uh, racism and hatred. And um, I am a part of many Asian American communities. And I mean, the stories are not mine to tell, but I will tell you that people have had very harrowing, harrowing experiences directed at them and at their young children. Um, that are clearly linked to fear of COVID-19 because, you know, people will explicitly say things um, that um, that relate to uh, the virus and, and why their people brought it into this country. And it's a it's a terrible time. And um, I, I don't know what advice I have, except that we should all be aware that it's happening. Um, I, I have a number of friends who said I didn't see it until you pointed it out. And now it's it's terribly obvious. And so um, I think we all. Um, I think just acknowledging it when you see it, even though you're not the target of it, um, being really explicit that this is not acceptable right now. Um, I, I think people being the best allies they can be because it's very hard in the moment um, when you're experiencing that kind of racism to stand up for yourself um, or for your family members. Um, so I think this is one of those times where we really need people to call it out and to tamp it down quickly where they see it happening. Well said. I mean, and to this point of collateral damage, I know that you've also talked to um, about some of the other downstream um, medical effects that you've seen uh, that are not even connected to people contracting the virus at all. You know, you've talked about domestic violence, and I'd love to hear you, I guess, address that a little bit more. Just what, what are you seeing uh, as it relates to those sorts of uh, issues? Yeah, this is something that's, um, again, been traveling around um, my community, my online communities of, uh, of physicians and nurses. Um, and, and this is only anecdotal now. I, I don't have the data, but I think it will come um, as we as we look back. But uh, when you put people into their homes 24 um, seven and and when you do that in a very economically stressful time where people are losing their jobs and, and feeling a lot of stress about just getting meals on the table, I mean, that is a setting in which um, in which family violence, child abuse, intimate partner violence will increase. And we're seeing that in the hospital. Um, I, I mean, I, I've seen a number of, of cases where people fled to the hospital because their home was simply not safe and became abruptly more not safe because of stay at home orders. Um, I've seen young children harmed because in their regular lives they could escape to school for a good chunk of the day, um, or they had these extended communities of family members and friends floating around, and then stay-at-home orders went to place and everybody retreated into their homes, and there was no, um, that barrier that always was the difference between safety and harm was suddenly removed and family violence went up. Um, and, and truly, I mean, I am a, a, a violence researcher. I'm always very attuned to the patients who come in who are experiencing violence, and I have never seen anything like this before. And, um, and I think uh, you will never attach a COVID-19 diagnosis to this. No, um, no review of medical records may really, um, may really attach this to COVID-19, but I consider this a, a, very, um, a very sad part of the collateral damage that's happening directly because of this disease. Um, well, and you know, as we uh, wrap up here, I think, I'm sure that this, this is something that a lot of folks out there are thinking about too, is just, you know, what is, I guess the, the big takeaway, what are the, the, the big things that we should know that we should do to ensure that we can get to the, what is, whatever the best case scenario is at this point? Yeah. Well, I would say uh, to, to, um, to give people a measure of hope and optimism, your little actions are working. Um, so I know there's nothing glamorous about do nothing and stay at home. Um, and I am so acutely aware of how much people are sacrificing. I mean, people are, they're sacrificing their businesses, their livelihood, and people who are just on the edge of being, uh, of feeling financially secure are just giving it all up to stay at home. 
Um, I, I mean, you couldn't ask for a bigger sacrifice, and yet those things are working. Um, look at what's happening in Ohio, in Oregon, um, in other states where we're really able to get ahead of this. We are protecting ourselves, our family members, um, and also importantly, our really vulnerable members of society, our, our older citizens, uh, by doing these things and, and doing that sacrifice. So I think um, while we're going through some really, really tough times in these hardest hit cities, um, what we're, uh, what everyday people are doing in response is really working. So I, I think it can feel futile. I think sometimes to just kind of sit quietly and do your um, social distancing thing, um, and nobody, uh, you know, there's no glory in that, and it's also can be incredibly boring. I'm learning, um, looking online and seeing how creative people are getting with their dance moves and their uh, bread recipes, um, but it really is also heroic work, um, and it is saving lives for sure. So thank you to everybody for for that simple act. It's making everything better. Well. Thank you, Dr. Chu. I think um, I speak for uh, everyone and uh, how, how much we appreciate you coming, spending time with us today, sharing your experiences and your wisdom and knowledge. Um, Helen, did you have any uh, last things that you wanted to share? Only that it's kind of you to try and deflect, but we all know who the heroes are around here and it's, it's pretty okay to be able to sit on a sofa and watch TV. So thank you for everything that you're doing and just the deepest appreciation and gratitude from everybody who's been watching from everyone at TED and from a hell I'll speak for everyone in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chu.